How you guys doing? Oh, am I on? This. Hello, can you guys hear me? Okay, how are you guys doing today? I know this is the end of the day. I'm hoping they saved the best for last, but uh, we'll see how that goes. But um, said, you guys learned a little about me. My name is Dell Demps. Um, I've been an NBA basketball lifer, and I'm here today really to be here as someone that can give you guys some insight of what goes on in the NBA, how it pertains to you and the NBA draft process. And so I don't want to just sit here and talk to you guys for an hour. I want you guys to interact at any time. If you guys have any questions, please just raise your hand and um, we'll answer those questions. And so what we're going to talk about today to start with is the NBA draft process. And the NBA, how many guys know how many players there are in the NBA? Does anybody know how many players are in the NBA? 450. 30 teams, 15 players on each team, so there's 450 players in the NBA. And during a season, sometimes guys get cut, sometimes you know, teams sign new players. So during a, a, a typical NBA season, there'll be somewhere around 475 to 400, 500 guys in the NBA. And so first one, I want to talk about those players in the NBA. Can we put on the um, player maps? Most NBA teams break down every player in the NBA. And we, in, in the organizations I've been, we call it player maps. We're going to start off in the player maps. We're going to talk about the franchise players. You guys, do you know any franchise players? Can you guys name any franchise players? You got LeBron, you got Giannis, you got Steph Curry. There's typically, you guys can look up here, there's typically 10 to 12, maybe 14 of those guys at one time in the NBA. Now, these lists right here, these player reps, it changes. Like years ago, Tim Duncan or Dirk Nowinski or Dwayne Wade, they were franchise guys. But then it changes. Most organizations, they update these lists three times a year. And so this year, we felt like Nikola Jokic, he jumped in that, that, that franchise tag with Denver Nuggets. And so then the next group you have is the core guys. Those are the guys that are really, really good. And it's self-explanatory as you look at the examples. Those are the guys that they'll make the all-star team most years. They'll probably be three to eight-year all-stars during their career. But they'll be all-star players. They're really, really good players. They're just not quite great. And then what I really want you guys to focus on is the next groups. That's the top starters, key reserves. That's your Harrison Barnes, your Andre Iguodala's. Those are the guys that are starters on most teams, or at the worst, they would be sixth or seventh men on really good teams. And then you have your rotation and your roster minimum salary players. Those are usually the guys that are like 9 to 12 on the roster. And if you really look at that, how many guys do I say there are in the NBA? How many? We're going to need some more energy out of you guys today. How many guys are in the NBA? Okay. If you just take an average of the top starters and key reserves and rotation players, that's about 250 of the players in the NBA. The next thing that's real important is when you look at the developmental players. Those are a lot of the players that come in at a young age, and a lot of times they get drafted. They don't always make it to those next levels. They don't. And so most teams will have one to three of those guys on their roster, and they're hoping they'll project into one of those players above. But the guys who played the long term in the NBA, the meat of the NBA is really those top starters, key reserves, rotation players. Those are the guys. Now, you always see the guys at the bottom that are the fringe, non-guarantee guys trying to make it. And then they actually added in the last couple of years the two-way contracts. And so we'll talk about a little bit more of that stuff a little bit later. The next thing is scouting, OK? So, when you guys get back to your campuses, you might have already had it now, you're going to start having NBA people coming in to watch your practices. Most scouting departments start their seasons off like this. They'll have, hey, we got to find everybody. These guys are experts. These guys are looking at you guys and if you guys can help them win basketball games. And so they'll break it down and say, hey, these are our goals for the year. And you'll see conference experts. Most teams, they'll break their scouting departments up by region. They'll have a guy in the south. They'll have a guy in the east, in the west, midwest. And they'll be experts on the conference. These guys are going to be watching all your games. They'll be coming to your practices. And then they're going to be talking to everybody in the group. 
Another thing would be is synergy. Who knows what synergy is? Want to explain what synergy is? Stand up, stand up. Yeah, but what, what it is, it's a computer program. And so basically you can go on this computer program and you can pull up practically any game. And you can break it down by teams or you can break it down by players. And so how I can break it down is so I can come in and I say, we got Jalen right here, right? I can take Jalen. I can go on the computer. I can pull up the school. I can pull up Jalen. I can say, okay, I want to look at all his shots. And I can look at every shot he's taken for the whole season and last season and the season before that. If he played for USA Basketball, um, high schools, any of the um, all-star camps, they can pull up all of that. And then they can also pull up, okay, I just want to look at his jump shots. Or they can say, hey, you know what, I want to just look at his defense. They can just show when he's playing individual defense. And they can just do it by a click of a button. And they can do that for Jalen. And they can also do it for the kid that's playing in Serbia. They can do it for the kid that's playing in China, the kid that's playing in South America. And so you guys got to think there's this whole bucket of players that at the push of a button, you can just go and you can look at everything that they do. Next thing I want to do is I want to just go now to the next diagram. Scouting. So now, we just talked about the live scouting when they come to your practice to watch your games. We talked about they can watch the video. They can look at, yeah, the, conf the conference experts. And then the thing that's been very, very important as of late, very, very important is the top thing. And that bubble should probably actually be bigger. Background and intelligence. Does anybody know about background and intelligence? I would say of most NBA scouts, 70% of their job is background and intel. 70%. And that's what they want to know everything about you. When they come to those practices, when they come to the games, they want to talk to your coaches. They want to talk to your former coaches. They want to talk to anything that any of the trainers, they want to talk to, they really want to talk to the team managers. They want to talk to everybody they can about you. Because like I said, we can watch every play of every game at any time. What we can't do is find out what type of person you are. And the backgrounds are so important because right now in the NBA, there are a lot of good guys. The majority of the guys are really good. And what no one wants to do is bring a problem into their organization. They want to know everything about you because they want to bring a good group of people in. No one wants to work with a jerk. The locker rooms are so good right now. We got a saying in the NBA, and it's a very important saying. I want you guys to remember this. Are you better than your problems? You got to be really, really good right now to be a problem in the NBA. There's just too many good guys. There's just too many of them. There's too many guys doing the right thing. When you sit down and you talk to coaches, they want good guys in the locker room. They want guys that have a good basketball IQ that know how to play. They want guys that want to put the team first. It's so important right now. How many of you guys have been watching the World Championships? Has anybody been watching the World Championships? Who's in the final tomorrow? Spain and Argentina. United States lost. You know, this was really the first time in a long time the United States played in the World Championships when they didn't have the best players. First time in a long time. And so the world is just getting better. And these teams, they're playing together. And the key is playing together, teamwork, winning. Make no mistake about it, the NBA is a production-based business. It's a multi-billion dollar production-based business, and it's about winning. And when we're looking at all these maps and looking at all these stats, they want guys that are going to help them win. And how are they going to help them win? You have to play together. You have to play as a team. And what I really want to talk to you guys about today is the team first mentality. Because the team first mentality really promotes individual success. It's not the other way around. It's not like my individual success is going to make the team better. It's the team wants, needs to win. Because that's what they're looking at right now is who's going to help them win games. And so then, the next thing we want to talk about is the analytics. And so we can take that screen down. And so you, you can take it down. 
the analytics, okay? So now, we talked about the scouting. The guys are going to come there, they're going to watch you guys play. We can watch every shot that you take, okay? We can watch every game that you play. We talk about your background, what type of teammate you are, how good are you working with others. What coaches are going to know, is he coachable? Does he know how to play? The one thing that's in demand right now, that's very much in demand, is multi-positional players, two-way players. Why? These coaches are smart now. If you can't guard your position, you know what's going to happen in the NBA? The other team's best offensive player is going to find you. These guys are really smart. They're really smart. They're going to find a way to get the worst defender on the other team's best player, and then they're going to attack that mismatch. And so what teams want? They want two-way players. Two-way players are in demand. Another thing that's in demand is the team players, guys who are willing to give themselves up. And that's what I want to talk to you guys now about analytics. How much do you guys know about analytics? Okay, I'm going to give you guys an example, okay? What's the best way to determine a great rebounder? What stat gives us a great rebounder? Somebody. Somebody's got to tell me. Rebound. How, what? Rebounds. Give me some, what kind of rebounds? Offensive rebounds. Well, how can we measure that? How can we measure that? Out of your area rebound. That's actually that's an analytic. That, that's also an analytic stat. If you can go get rebounds out of your area. But I want you guys, let's, let's go back simpler. What, when you guys look at the leaders in rebound, they usually do it by what? Rebounds per game? Okay, so that's kind of like the old school way of doing it. We look at, okay, a guy averages 12 rebounds a game, and so we'll say, okay, he's a great rebounder. And then they start thinking. They're like, well, is he really that great? Because if he's playing 35 minutes a game, and this other guy's only playing 12 minutes a game, how can we compare if he's really a better rebounder than this other guy? So they say, hey, you know what? Let's do it by how many minutes they play. So we'll go rebounds per minute. So for a while, that was a big thing, how many rebounds you can get per minute, OK? Who knows what a good rebounder gets per minute? How many rebounds they get per minute? Does anybody know? Three. If you can get three rebounds, I mean, if you, I'm sorry. If you can get one rebound per three minutes at one time, you're considered a great rebounder, elite rebounder. If he can get one rebound every three minutes, that's how they looked at it. But then these guys got smarter. They're thinking like, well, what if this one guy's playing in the game and they're playing up and down? You know, they're playing like against the Warriors and there's more rebounds in the game. And this other team, they're playing real slow. So even though this guy's playing this many minutes, he didn't have as many opportunities. So they're saying, well, you know what? Let's take it to a different level. Let's say every available rebound, what's the rebounding percentage? So for every missed shot, who gets that rebound? Does anybody know what a good rebounding percentage is for an elite rebounder? An elite rebounder, elite, is going to get 20% of all possible rebounds. And that's how these analytic guys are thinking. And so sometimes when you guys hear these analytics, you know, you'll hear some people say, I don't believe in that analytics. You know, that's not real. But when you really start thinking about it, they say, okay, how many missed shots there are? Who gets those percentage of the shots? That's the kind of thinking that goes on. And it goes on for scoring. It goes on for assists. But one of the biggest things now in analytics is impact on winning. Does your production impact winning? Because ultimately, that's the most important stat. And so now, they've got to the point where they're looking at, OK, when you're on the court, how does your team do? So like if you're on the court, if you look at a, just a regular NBA stat sheet, a lot of times, you ever, ever see the plus minus? And so when they look at the plus minus, if you're on the court, sometimes you don't have to do anything, and your team can do well. So I'll give you an example. Let's say like Steph Curry. Okay, so Steph Curry comes off a of pick and roll, right? And you don't show, what's he gonna do? He's gonna make the three. He makes like 63% of his uncontested threes. So two people are gonna come after Steph Curry when he comes off the pick and roll, right? So who is he gonna throw it to? Draymond. So now Draymond has the ball. What's he gonna do? Sometimes he gets a layup, right? And then Steph gets the assist. Or sometimes he'll dribble in, he'll bring the defense in, and he'll kick it out to Clay Thompson. 
And what the analytics is saying is like, all that really happened because of who? Because Steph was willing to give himself up. And that's going to be the question for you guys. Are you going to be willing to give yourself up? Are you going to be willing to give yourself up for your team's production? And that's the hard part. And I'll tell you what, that's the hard part. Because now, we'll talk about another thing that we call, it's called managing the noise. The noise is big. It's big out there. That's when you got your family members, you got the friends, you got the social media. You got people telling you, man, you got to be aggressive. You got to go make a play. But so many times we go to practice or we go to the games and we're all sitting there and we can see it. We, we can see it. We can see it like this guy's breaking the team system where he knows he should have made that pass, but he's trying to get his. Because he's trying to get his, and he thinks that's going to get him to the next level. And we just sit there, and everybody's like, ah, oh, man. Because let's go back and think about some things I said. We can watch every play. We can watch every time you turn the ball over. And basically what happens is when you're in a scouting meeting, we're sitting in a room a little smaller than this, usually at a table like that. We'll have the video on. And a lot of times the coach will come in. And so have the scouts, and the scouts will be talking about this player, and they'll put on this synergy, and the coach wants to win. And so he'll look at the guy, he'll see, he's like, did he just take two step back threes in a row with three people on him? And you guys want to bring him here? Coach, like, you guys trying to get me fired. <laughs> Nobody wants that. And that's where you guys got to be smart. That's where you guys got to know that you guys are playing in the Big East Conference. You guys have got to trust that the NBA people, they know what they're doing. They know when you give yourself up. They know when you give yourself up so your team can be successful. They know when you're playing the right way. And they're going to go back and they're going to ask your coaches. And they're going to ask, like, hey, is this guy a team guy or is he about himself? And that's where it gets tough because this is some times where you guys are in this fishbowl. Everybody's looking at you. And you guys got pride. And there are going to be times you think, like, man, I got to go get 20 points tonight. But I'm telling you, when we're looking at it, you know, I want to say, there is a good 20. If you sit and you go six for 12, and you hit a couple threes, and you get some free throws, and you got 20, that's going to look good with the analytics. But if you go six for 22 to get your 20, that doesn't look good. That means you're taking bad shots. That means you're not playing for the team. And ultimately, we talked about those maps. We talked about those 250 guys in the NBA. One of the characteristics of those guys in the NBA, they have a great understanding of who they are as a player. And sometimes that's the hardest thing for players to grip, who they are as a player. What do I do well? What do I do to help the team win? Because ultimately, that's what it's about, helping the team win. And there will be a guy who's like, hey, man, you're really good at getting in the lane. You can find people. You can get people the ball. But then you got somebody in your ear saying, you got to start taking more threes. You got to find a way to get more threes because that's going to get you to the NBA. And the three's not there. The three's not there, and you're taking that three. We're sitting in the room. We're sitting like, man, he just made six good plays. Why would he do that now? He's going to do that if he comes to play for us. And so what I really want to just preach to you guys is the team first mentality is going to promote individual success. Some of the characteristics of very good NBA players, one of the first ones is, is they're smart. They understand who they are as a player. They understand what it takes to win. They understand that they got to be in the gym. And if your three ball is not there right now, you can work on it. You can get in the gym, and you can work on it, and you can work on it, and you can work on it, and you can take it when the time is right. And the time will be right. It will be. But you've got to be able to be smart. You've got to understand what's, what's in the team concept and what's going to help the team win, and how can you help the team win. Anybody have any questions? Any questions? No question. All right. We'll keep moving along. Next thing. 
life after basketball. It's so important. And you guys got this great opportunity right now. Most of you guys, I'm guessing, are 17 to 20 right now. Probably 17 to 19. And hopefully, you'll play in college for how many years that is. You'll play professional basketball. But then at some point, it's going to end. At some point. You guys got a great opportunity right now to start preparing for that. There's a saying that I like to say. It's called plan your work and then work your plan. And then you got to have a backup plan. And you got to have a plan with timelines. And how that works is like right now, you guys are in college. You guys are picking your degrees right now. Have you guys picked your degrees? Some of you guys might be undecided. Who's picked a degree right now? What'd you pick? Exercise science. What'd you pick? Journalism. Anybody else? Say that one more time. And so now, I want you guys to think about this. You don't have to say you're going to stay in that field. But what you have to start thinking is like, hey, what do I like? What is fun to me? What do I want to do for the rest of my life? Myself, I wanted to be a part of basketball. When I was an undergraduate, I went to a small school, University of Pacific. I didn't get drafted. I was one of those guys that was on that MAPS, what they call fringe non-guaranteed contract. I never had a guaranteed contract when I played in the NBA. I was fortunate enough to play 10 years of professional basketball, but what it doesn't say is I played all over the world. Every year I played on a different team. I played in Europe, I played in South America, I played in Asia, and I wouldn't change it for the world. But when I was playing, one thing I realized is that this was going to end soon. And my first thought was I wanted to go into coaching. I wanted to be a coach. But then I started looking. I was like, man, all these really good players are getting all the coaching jobs. And so I had to figure out a way how could I differentiate myself. And so I was always pretty good in math. I was a business major, had a strong concentration in finance. I said, I'm going to go back to school while I was playing and I got my MBA. I attained my MBA when I was 28. I finished playing when I was 31. And why I did that was because when I finished playing, I wanted to be able to differentiate myself into a career in basketball. And when I started out, like I said, I wanted to be in coaching. I was volunteering, and while I was volunteering, I did some volunteer work at San Antonio Spurs. They let me send in on a contract negotiation, and just to make a long story short, is when they, I got to watch the Spurs work on Tim Duncan's contract negotiation, his contract extension. I said, I want to do this. I went back. I just studied the co collective bargaining agreement for the next two years, and that's how I started my way into management. And I started from the bottom. I started as an intern, and I basically I worked my way up. And so that was my path. And what I'll say to you guys is find something that you want to be a part of whether it's sports, whether it's entertainment, whether it's law, whether it's journalism, whether whatever it is, you have an opportunity now. You're going to be meeting people now that can open so many doors for you moving forward. And for some of you guys, it will be in sports. And for some of you guys, it might not be in sports. But whatever it is, I would say now is the time to do the research. Now is the time to get on the internet. Find something that you think you want to do when you're 35, when you're 40, when you're 45, and something that can make you happy to know what you're going to do for the rest of your life. And so I would say plan your work, work your plan, have a backup plan in case it doesn't work, but you got to just now the time to do the research. You guys have the time. Now is definitely the time to do that. Next thing I want to talk to you guys is when you get back to your campuses. When you get back to your campuses, and you start getting on the court, time management. Time management is so important. And you're going to have the demands of your practice, you have the demands of your study, and you have to have the demands of having a social life. And what I'll say to you guys is plan that out now. If you know you're going to be practicing two to three hours a day, and you know you got time that, hey, I might, some guys like to play video games, some guys like to hang out. Some guys like to read. Some guys like to watch movies. Plan that out now. 
And so you can get all your work accomplished, but then also plan to figure out how can you get that extra time in the gym. Because that's so important, getting that extra time in the gym will make you guys better basketball players. But like I said, you can plan all that out. I feel like I'm doing too much of the talking right now. So you guys got to have some type of question for me from an NBA perspective, what we're looking at. The number one stat we look at. It's interesting. It depends on the player. You know what I mean? So like, when I was in San Antonio and when I was in New Orleans, we really wanted to be a good defensive team. We felt like defense wins championships. And so we were consistently trying to find players that could be two-way players, that could complement our star players and also be good defenders. And, you know, one of the guys, you know, you guys might not know of him, but Bruce Bowen when I was in San Antonio. He, he was elite. I mean, he was a really good defender. And for a couple of years, he's one of the top three-point shooters in the league. And when I was in New Orleans, we had a player, Drew Holiday. And Drew Holiday is maybe one of the most underrated players in the NBA. But from a night in, night out, I don't think there's a coach in the league that wouldn't want to have him. I mean, like, here's a guy that he comes out and he guards the best player, whether he's the one, two, or three. We basically, for the years I was in New Orleans, we always had him guarding the other team's best player. And then offensively, we asked him to go get 20 points and eight assists. And Tell us, he, he did it with a smile. Just to tell you a little bit about him was he really did a great job in what I call investing in his body. And um, every day um, he used to have this guy that used to travel with him. And you know, they would come back to the facility at night and he'd be doing stretches and he'd be working on his body and he'd just be doing everything that he could to make himself the best basketball player that he possibly could be. And, you know, from my perspective, it was always a joy to have Drew Holiday on our team. Just to yeah, I have one. Can you talk to them about the importance of having size to their position? And if they don't, what are the qualities of players who don't have size for position? What have you found the reasons why they may? Okay, positional size is a very important stat. And so, you know, one of the things I want to talk to you guys about is when you have size at your position, it really helps you defend your position. It helps you get your shot off. But there's what we call outliners. And the, the outliners are very important because right now we're going to positionless basketball. So when teams play small, right, sometimes they'll have a 6'8 center out there, a 6'9 center. What are some important things we need that center, that six, seven, six, eight guy to be able to do? Rebound. Because when teams go small, one of the biggest things is who's going to get the rebound? So guards that can rebound, small guards that can rebound, that has been important. Like Steph Curry is actually a good rebounder. If you guys look at the history of his rebounding, he's a good rebounder for his position. You have to have guys that can do multiple things. And so... It's a lot easier when you're a 6'6 wing and you have a 6'12 or 6'11 wingspan. That's going to make people look like, hey, this guy's long, he's athletic, he has size. But when you don't have size, the key is you have to be able to do something else. You have to be able to be a good rebounder. You have to be a good defender. Someone said switching. If you're a big and you can switch on a guard, that's important because into the shot clock, they're going to put you in a pick and roll. And if you can switch and you can keep a guard in front of you, that's an NBA skill. One of the things that's going on in NBA too right now that I didn't talk about is this, this thing called modeling. Who knows what modeling is? Now I know it's fashion week here in New York, and so, but modeling is something a little bit different. What they've done is, from an analytic standpoint, you guys will be a part of this, 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 this study. And so what they do is like, there's several teams right now, like I, I just saw that there's one team I saw now, they have nine people working in their analytics department. Nine people working on numbers. And what they do is they went back and they said, let's look at all the successful NBA players. And so we'll start off. They say he's a six foot two guard and he played in a big conference and he averaged 15 points a game. He shot 40% from three and he uh, 
averaged six rebounds a game. And then, okay, let's say this other guy, he's a 6'7 wing, and he went to a small college, not one of the big six conferences, but he averaged 19 points a game. They put all this into a bucket. They look at all your measurements. They look at your athletic testing, and they put it all in the bucket. They say, okay, Chris Paul, he played two years at Wake Forest. These were his stats. And then they'll say, okay, Clay Thompson, he played three years at Washington State. Here are his stats. This is what he did. And what they'll do is they're going to project what type of NBA player you are. That's the model. And so they can it'll just spit it out. It'll say, okay, um, we got John here. Okay, here's John's stats. Here's he played at a big conference. This is the type of NBA player we think he's going to be. We think that in his first two years in the NBA, he'll average six points or he'll average eight points if he gets to play. And then by year three, he'll average 14 points, and then that will be his peak. Or he'll say, hey, ah, this guy, he's not going to make it. He'll struggle. He'll have a hard time getting a shot. And the model is what everyone asks, like, how accurate is it? Each team has a different model. And for some teams, they might put more of an emphasis on defense and rebounding. Some teams might put more of an emphasis on three-point shooting and assists. And each model will tell, like, hey, this is why we want this guy. And what it can really do, too, is, you know, when these guys go scouting, one of the things that's important to most teams is like when we have the scouts go out, what we don't want is reporters. What a reporter is, the reporter comes back and says, hey, I went to the game and I watched uh, Marquette play and Joe Blow, he hit three threes and he got four assists. He played really good defense. That doesn't help us. What we want to know is how does that project into an NBA game? We want projectors. We want to say, okay, he got to the rim four times and he finished three of them, but were there any shot blockers in there? Can he, is he going to be able to finish over the NBA bigs? Okay, yeah, he played really good defense, but can he switch out into a guard if he's a big? We want to see what projects to an NBA game because sometimes you'll see, like, there'll be a guy that plays in college and he averages 20 points a game. You're like, man, how come he the guy didn't get drafted? And the reason why he didn't get drafted is most people will think that – what he did didn't project into an NBA, NBA game. Any other questions? What is like the typical day like uh, from your perspective as a GM and also from like, uh, like an NBA player? A typical day of, of an NBA player? Yeah. On a non-game day, most teams will practice at 10 o'clock. And what most guys will do, especially the young guys, they'll probably get in the building around 8.15, 8.30. And most teams will have breakfast ready for you. Um, and then you'll have some type of weight training, um, conditioning, um, something to do with your body. And then most young players will get on the court and start doing individual work. And then the team will come in. Most teams will have a five to 10 minute film session before practice. You'll have practice and then most NBA players' days finish by noon. By noon, you're free to do whatever you want. What a lot of guys do is they come back in the evening. A lot of guys come back at 5, 6 o'clock to get extra work in. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable how hard guys work in the NBA. And um, some guys are just one-a-day guys. Some guys are two-a-day guys. On a game day, it's a little bit different. Um, most teams will have shoot around at either 10 or 11. You'll come in usually... If it's 10 o'clock, young guys will usually come in and still get their work in around 9. Um, you'll basically watch some film on usually yourself and the opposing team, go through the scouting report, get some shots up, and your day is over. If it's a 10 o'clock shoot around, you're usually out of there by 11. And then most guys get to the arena for a 7 o'clock game. They usually get to the arena by 5 o'clock. That's a good question. Um, I don't know if you guys heard him, but he said if it's, if, it's, if it's a tie, if it's close between two guys, what was one of the most important things that I said scouts are looking at? Background. Background. What type of person are you? 
You know what I mean? Like, who are we bringing to this locker room? That, like, you know, one guy, and, and sometimes that's a tie. And then a lot of times, you know, what extra are you bringing to the table? What are you bringing that the team really wants? And that, that's, that's really what it really comes down to. And a lot of times, you know, it, when, it's, when it's really close, you know, people go back and forth. And there's no exact science. You know what I mean? There, there, there isn't one. Um, but like I said, the attitude, the character, the basketball IQ, if you know how to play, if you're a team guy, those things are so important right now in today's NBA. All right, and the last thing I'll just conclude on, guys, is say I know the long day. Um, enjoy yourselves right now. I know there's going to be pressure. I know there's going to be people coming at you. I know there's going to be people in your ear saying this and that. But the thing I can say is right now, enjoy yourselves. Enjoy your time in college. Have a good time. Find some ways to have fun because you're going to look back on these days. There's going to be days you're going to remember. And have fun with your teammates. I mean, you know, you guys are going to have jokes that no one else are going to think is funny, but you guys will know why it's funny. And I would say enjoy that. You know, this is going to be some of the best years of your life. I'm excited for you guys. I can't wait to watch you guys play. And I hope you guys can remember some of the things that I said today. And remember this, the team first mentality. The team first mentality promotes individual success. Because what the NBA really wants is guys who can help them win. That's all I have for you guys. Thank you.